And then let me go live on another platform. Hold on. Okay, we are, and now we'll do the brand, the names. Why, hello. Why, hello, Dennis. So nice hello, to see Renee. you today. <laughs> so nice to see you today. And hello, and we're, world. We're... Anybody who, 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 is, who is watching, <clears throat> we're, um, I'm, I'm Dennis Tardon, as you can see down at the bottom, not Tardon. Tardon. I was just going to make a joke. Damn it. You took that from me. I was going to say, hi, ta hi. hi, Tardon. How's Tardon yeah. doing today? Yeah, exactly. It drives me nuts. I want everyone yeah. to know it drives me nuts. But it's okay. okay. I'm very forgiving, but it, it does drive me nuts. But it does. And this is Renee Jaworski, the COO and the CMO of the Tardon Media Network. And we have made great strides in getting our webpage uh, moved with the wonderful Martin Dowman from Light and Water Media, one of our sponsors who is doing our webpage. And and so so big things are to come. But today, what we're doing today is that we have, we're doing some biographical work. And this is the important part of, of doing some of the life and legacy. And we're starting today with, with uh, you, Renee. And because <clears throat> so much of the world is driven and, and exceeded by the nonprofit and the not-for-profit world, uh, the, the NGOs, the work, and you got into it early. What was, what was your impelling and introduction into getting into the nonprofit world? Thank you, Dennis. Yes, uh, the, first, the first thing that I did with nonprofits was anti-death penalty stuff when i was 13 years mm -hmm. old oh you're back in the green <laughs> with the dueling that was that was awesome and All i want right. everyone to know that everyone missed a brooklyn accent i was going real hard and heavy before we went live and then i realized we weren't live but it was hilarious. Dennis, come on back now. Absolutely. All right. So okay. I'm asking you, but I'm asking you to, to, to go into, all right. So you're 13 years old and where are you? So that would have been in upstate New York. And so what year is this? Early nineties. So this is the early nineties. Uh, Attica had already happened. Attica had already happened. And I just realized we have to go back to the eighties now because Actually, my first stuff with nonprofit, which I don't really talk about because I forget, but was with animal rights. Mm -hmm. Animal rights was my big thing. I was an equestrian since when I was five years old. And then when I was around seven, eight and nine years old, seven, eight, nine, I got in with like we like I was radicalized by these animal rights activists. And a lot of my friends got into that. I don't know. It must have been big up here in the 80s. I don't know. But. A it was big of, all over. I mean, animal rights okay. was it was a big. I mean, this this was a, a coming thing. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so that's what, what how I started. So as a little kid, and I, it was self done. I don't remember any adult taking me through it. I had a book saying, you know, a hundred and one things you know kids can do to change the world, and there was animal rights stuff, and we didn't have the webs the we didn't have web stuff, but they would have phone numbers, and so you would call different people or companies who had done egregious things against animals and you would call them and you would, or you would call your Congress, you know, rep your, your representatives in con Congress. So mm -hmm. I learned about how to do that as a really little kid. I remember making, you know, that was like hours and hours. We would make phone calls. My friends and I would make phone calls about, you know, please don't leave the animals in cages. And then we did a lot of, I was, I was vegetarian. I became a vegan at that time. You know, the fur places we would call fur industries, we would, you know, then we would we would donate to PETA. We would raise money for, for PETA. All of that was going on. Then when I'm 13 or 14, I watch Dead Man Walking. I become obsessed with the un, with the question of someone who does like the worst thing you could imagine, who kills another human being. Are they still human? And would I be able to actually have, you know, relate with somebody like that? And because wow. they were in jail and they're in prison, I felt safe to start that process. I, they weren't going to. All right, but hold me. on. You're a 13 year mm -hmm. old girl. 
what yes. does what does Chris, uh, Christine Bochco, your mother, mm -hmm. say about your wanting to go into prisons, into into death row, and work there? I I don't really know. I know that her whole parenting philosophy was always um, to tr she trusts me. But then at a certain point, she did see all of my hours going into that. Now, remember at this age, I wasn't allowed to go into the prisons yet physically. So I was focusing more on a lot of um, letter writing, but it would, it took up my entire life and she was concerned about that. And so I do remember there being tension. I remember her, you know, coming into my bedroom at four in the morning saying, you're on death row you know, that, that I had, I had now, I was now on death row. Cause that was my entire, all my reading their letters, responding to their letters, thinking about it, petitioning. Then I started going to marches. I organized and that was all in New York. Then when I moved to Georgia, when I was 18, the first thing I did was I started Athenians against the death penalty, which then later I started working with Georgians for alternatives to the, for the death, to the death penalty. And that was sort of absorbed into a chapter. But that's when I start going physically into the uh, death row at, in um, Georgia, meeting the men face to face that I had been writing letters to, and also Pennsylvania, just different areas and stuff like that. But in Georgia, it is face to face and you are in a room um, with these people. And so I got to meet like one guy particularly that I had met when I was 14 through letters. We had stayed in contact. I was able to actually be with him. You know, he was right. young. So how did you keep how did you keep the the emotional distance? Because here you are, you're a young, beautiful woman, and you're coming up with these men and and the men could very easily get emotionally entangled with you. How did you deal with that? I absolutely um I either did it really, I think about it all the time. I have pictures, which I wouldn't show publicly, but obviously I'll show you, Dennis. But um, I have pictures of what literally what that looked like because we we they allow Polaroids in some of the death rows. So we I do have Polaroid, <laughs> do have Polaroids mm -hmm. of me doing. And at that time, I met when I was about 20. I met a young, she was 30, a nun who was very beautiful, ravishingly beautiful and in the full habit. I met her at some event somewhere. And when we met, we went out for coffee and we just were like sisters. And she told me she does prison work. And she said to me, um, wait, let me, I want to look at you though for a second. Mm -hmm. I just need your emotional support. <laughs> so yeah. she told me that, she said, well, uh, yeah, she asked me that question. And I said, you know, I didn't really take it seriously. In my mind, mm -hmm. coming to it from organizational work and then also with a religious slant, which at the time I also definitely had religious um, mission slant. Right. In, in my heart, I, I kept the same boundaries that I kept with everyone because – that's just I I didn't want to think of myself as better than or more distant or more elevated than because when I was a kid I contacted these men to ask a question are they monsters or are they just like me or somewhere in between and the the answer that I got over sev the first several years was that they were people just like me and right. and there many of them the grace of God. Yes, and many of them, not all of them, of course, but many of them were innocent of the crime that they were on death row for. And many were exonerated, mm -hmm. sometimes after their their execution, unfortunately, but sometimes before. So I'm not just guessing that they were innocent. They were literally innocent. They were found to be innocent. So in that case, you're just dealing so with someone who has very different situations than than I had. So I didn't keep um, an otherness. I tried to come in. I allowed them to affect and influence me in a way that 
we can judge it now, but I can only be honest about what I did, which mm -hmm. was I allowed them to partially raise me, even though I had a family. I got in so early and I was so emotionally invested that I allowed them to influence my philosophy and my life and my emotional awareness and my spiritual awareness. And so I allowed them to sort of raise me in a way that someone from my background usually wouldn't be able to be around people like that. So it's, a, it's interesting. That's one of, but the strong point of that is that now as an adult, I feel like I can relate to almost anyone I sit down with. You're <clears throat> because I'm all right. So this was part of your nonprofit work about, uh, and then you got, yes. you got organized and you organized people. What, what did you learn about the, this world? I mean, did, did you think that you wanted to go into it as a, as your career? Was this the, the position that you wanted to do? Yes. I, I be, I ended up getting a mentor because we would set up tables at human rights fests and things mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, Laura from Georgian Georgians for alternatives to the death penalty. I'm blanking on her last name right now, but she would always be at the booth like next to us. And so we mm -hmm. would talk. And at some point she took me under her wing. She was older than I, and she would teach me how to run a nonprofit, how to raise money, how to go up for funding, and also how to get people engaged. Like she would say to me, give people a small manageable task, but give them a task. Because people would show up and they'd say, we want to help. We have to just tell them what to do to help. So if yes. it's signing the petition or if it's booking you for a speaking engagement. And I did speaking engagements and things like that, too. And then after that, you know, so that's a lot of death penalty work. And then at some point I expanded and I started working with women face to face in the jail at Clark County. Mm -hmm. And that was an and that was an added dimension that then I took on that was very personal because there would be one on one meetings face to face for long extended periods of time and you get locked in literally they lock you in a cell with a, with someone who's committed murder or something right. like that and and you just i never was afraid i i don't i, I don't know if it was stupidity or boldness but i never was afraid I've, i don't i don't think so. other things yeah but i don't remember being afraid ever in those situations i've been afraid in other situations, but I think I knew at, I knew I was protected. And I also felt I was doing God's work. So that's another thing is I always felt that if something did go wrong when I was doing it, it would be worth it. Yeah. Well, it I mean, this is the, the but, but is the nonprofit part of you, part of your being driven by your spiritual life, by what you, what you believe? Yeah, it was a hundred percent. So I'm there not as myself. I'm there as a representative. I think that's another reason why the men, quote unquote, falling in love or having that kind of obsessive thing never bothered me because I don't know why. But that was another thing is that for me, I'm there and I'm in my mind, I'm representing God. Mm -hmm. So I'm there representing God. And so to me, that's just where I was. I, I, I came, in other words, I wasn't overthinking it, which you will, you will find hard to believe because I overthink everything else. Everything. But I never. Go ahead I and never, take your call. No, I'll go no, ahead and talk. I'll, I'll go ahead and talk while you. No, while you do that. no, no, please. No, no, no. Stay here with me. This is, this is really significant stuff. No. Um, you're asking really penetrative questions that I need to answer because I never thought about these things. Mm -hmm. And these, but I will tell you this. These types of things are things that every car ride, every long car, car ride, every long festival that we were at, all the activists have these questions. Yeah. What are you doing about emotional boundaries? What are you doing? How do you feel about this? How do you, because when I would be going into the death rows, a lot of women, particularly women from Europe, will get into romantic relationships with men who are on death row. They see a lot of things in Hollywood. They they want to meet someone who has come from a certain lifestyle, right? In a safe. There's way. a romantic. There's a there's a romanticness about this. this there, there's been a lot of <clears throat> movies and and media about this. 
Exactly. There's a certain, and, and I, I'm not giving any judgment, but there are, is a certain segment of society that finds that alluring for whatever reason. Yep. And so I would sometimes carpool depending with some of these people mm -hmm. and, and then have visits like in tandem with them. And I would see what that looked like. And what I was doing was just so far, so different then that made no sense to me. For, so for me, it was always like an unspoken yeah, but thing. That, it, it is, but uh, again, I will, I, and I don't mean to, I'm not correcting you, I'm just saying, when you say it made no sense to an emotional, you're, not de you're dealing with the difference between an emotional and an intellectual. Right. And so you're the, the the people that are doing that are not dealing it from an emotional or from an intellectual place. They're dealing with it from their it's filling an emotional need that they have. Right, exactly. Thank so you. you can't you can't understand it. You can't it's not understand a bowl. It's not. And I would spend very little time yep. there. And I remember I remember I remember that the that the people who were visiting for non-organizational reasons, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I didn't overthink that either, but I just never, I would never um, begin a friendship with them. Right. I was, I was greatly um, supported by the Mennonite community north of Athens, Georgia. They have their own, the Mennonites have their own community. They would give me rides. I carpooled with them. Many long philosophical, spiritual, religious conversations with them and their interns who would come from all over the world and stay there. They worked with refugees on their on their farm and they would ride with me. They understood what I was doing and I understood what they were doing. We are there to open a window into this dark environment and to learn from the prisoners and to learn and then to teach whatever we can. But very quickly, when you go into a prison, I mean, if I, I can go in there saying I'm going to teach them something, but they're going to teach me. It has to be because if it isn't, a, if, if there isn't a two way, the, a two way communication and two way growth, something has gone wrong. One yes. of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this is because uh, uh, Julius Jones uh, was commuted today. The, the, his death sentence, he was supposed to be carried out at 4 o'clock uh, Central. It was commuted at noon by the, by the governor. And I have some resentment about that. Uh, okay, that let's talk about wh it. Why, why did it take him, why did it take the governor until noon to commute? Descent. That to me is cruel and unusual punishment. Why, if he, he was going to make that decision, the the Oklahoma Board of Paroles, uh, the yep. Republicans in the in the legislature, uh, all uh, the the Clemency Commission, all right. of them recommended him to do this. Why would he wait until noon? to make this decision, to, to put Julius through that. It, un, un, unless that, I mean, there, the, it, t to me, I, I am an, I'm a death penalty absolutist. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I do not believe that the state should have the power to take a life. I think that they could certainly put someone like Charles Manson into a into a cell and throw away the key. Yeah. Uh, certainly, the state has a right to do that. I do not believe in my personal, uh, in, in my philosophy, that the state should have the right to take away someone in the same way that I am a I am a private <clears throat> I'm a public prison absolutist. In other words, I do not believe that you that 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 human that we should profit over taking the freedom away from a human being. That there should be the profit motive within that, even if there is a better prison through the profit pr profit motive. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm talking myself out of it. I don't. <clears throat> But anyway, there there is. A, a, let's just stick with the death penalty. So so I understand on, on what we're we're doing. We have this wink of light, this life that is here. 
that we get a chance to join and the, and you decided to be able to take that and to work with the death penalty on that. Yes, and I want to I want to I want to give a lot of attention to what you were saying there. Okay, I want to unpack what you were saying because it was really significant to what I think is going on here emotionally and politically. You're talking about being an absolutist in that you don't believe that the state has the right to take a human life. They should I not will, be given the right. It's not that not they, uh, the, they, they do have the right to. They certainly yeah. have the right to because they have the arms. They have it. They, but I mm -hmm. believe that they should be, they should be legislatively uh, barred from taking a human life just by, uh, by, by law. Right. Now, I want to talk to you about that because that is central to my belief. In other words, even though I worked with people who were innocent, of, who were not guilty of the crime they were convicted of, mm -hmm. to me, that was not the compelling reason. The compelling reason was what is what you're talking about. And I'll tell you experientially and anecdotally, the feeling, the ugly feeling of that type of justice when they, when you're angry at someone because someone has hurt someone or done something really wrong and wicked, and you react in that moment, everyone can understand that passion, that justice, that, that hunger. Things happen during battles and war. Things happen when there's a skirmish. What's so ugly and uncomfortable and that this anger I have not unpacked yet is when a group of people who are outside of that situation coldly and calculatingly and with procedure over the course of decades take a human being, lock him up in a solitary thing, give him periodic uh, death notices, and then, of course, reverse it at, on varying degrees of closeness. Depending to that upon date. the appeals, yeah. Right. That type of psychological torture and also just having a human sit in that cell like that and deprive them of all human contact. They're not allowed to make love. They're not allowed to hold their children. In most cases, they're not allowed to. Uh, it, it's just and then the very men who are whole and well and women who are the COs, the guards who are laughing with them and bantering with them every day for years are the same ones that will hold them down and and let and then kill them to me and i've read a lot and i've talked with because when i would go to the jails the the prisons i would speak to a lot of the ceos and there's the psychological torture that that did to them is very ugly in Absolutely. other words no matter what crime someone has committed, no matter how terrible that person might even be, when you're eating with them and praying with them and you get to know their families day after day, and now you're going to escort them and tie them down and then stop their heart, I don't think we should be having other people live with that. Mm -hmm. That haunts them too. It's not a proper thing. It to can't. Do it can't be society. done. Yeah, it can't be done. The prison. It's too. Uh, the clinical. prison is. They're both. They're both. Everyone gets imprisoned on on that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> well, yeah, thank you that, for starting out this journey. With this is this is our journey to be able to know, and to learn our own storytelling, to learn about our stories. And you're teaching me you. more about you. And one of the things that I that I got so much out of this is how your <clears throat> your spiritual mm -hmm. core is yes. informing where you're going from age 13 actually before then but yes. as where we pick this up at age 13 how much this this is because i, I i've talked with many uh people within within the religious com excuse me com communities and um you're you're very much of a uh, a spiritually driven entity. Yes, everything that you do has everything. that spiritual has that 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 spiritual <clears throat> work with it, and it's yes. and it's and it and it certainly does not make you saintly. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
in in that sense but it does these are your aspirations and that is where I, when i came when i met you i think that's where we re resonated first uh that that, mm -hmm. that 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 was that that was that place and then all we both brought our own neuroses and our own challenges and <laughs> that's right, a different the... chapter of this we have a different chapter. god <laughs> there's there, this is just there is right the spiritual connection right but of course that right of course it is but then then you had to, and then uh, the, the purpose yeah. was there but then you got down to work so that's that's where the work we're, we're doing here on, here, here exactly yeah. so this is what we're doing on the uh, on the tardon media the, on network, the network. Right, on the network of what we're say. doing yes. and 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 thank you everyone that joined us for today for whatever portion of the conversation that you joined us with it it is such a pleasure yes thank you very much everyone